looks like I'm back in the movies again, doesn't it? Well, as a matter of fact, I'd like to do some talking. Just don't go away until I get this thing off. Now, it isn't as if it was a chore for me to talk to you because I want to speak on my favorite subject, the Army Air Forces. I can't speak from long experience. I've only been on the service a year, but I've learned a lot about what the Air Forces have to offer. That's what I want to talk to you about. Right now, the greatest mass mobilization in the history of the world is taking place. Men from cities, towns, farms, married men and single men, brothers, sweethearts, husbands, fathers and sons, businessmen and workers from the factories, and students from colleges and high schools all over America. They're mobilizing, joining up, or having their numbers pulled out of the fishbowl. And this war we're fighting today and tomorrow and the next day until we win is a war of the air. And the whole world knows that. Our factories know that. So, interceptors, pursuit ships, light bombers, medium bombers, and flying fortresses are rolling out of those factories. 65,000 fighting planes this year. 100,000 fighting planes next year. And to keep them flying, two million men. Now, now that's where you come in. The Army Air Forces need 15,000 captains, 40,000 lieutenants, 35,000 flying sergeants. Well, how about it? Well, let's talk it over. Now, make no mistake about this thing, fellas. We're all going to be in this war soon, sooner than a lot of you realize. And nearly all the officers of this great Army Air Force that they're building today are going to be drawn from the ranks of you men, from high schools and colleges, those who join as aviation cadets now. Uh, well, now, before I go any further, are there any questions? Yes, yeah, sure, I've got a question. Okay, shoot. Well, I'd like to join up. But I've got about a year of college left, and I'd kind of like to get that diploma. Well, why not? The Air Forces want you to get your diploma. Fellows like yourself, either in high school or college, can enroll in the Air Force Reserve. Continue with your studies, and at the end of the term, or when you get your diploma, you'll be taken in as a regular cadet, if you pledge now. Well, thanks. Okay, don't mention it. Hey, I'd like to make the Air Force, but I'm no brainstorm. My grades aren't exactly what they should be. I hear it's tough to get in. Not anymore, it is. And uh, that blocked letter you're sporting, that tells me a lot. Basketball, football, baseball, or some activity where coordination, control, and the ability to work together with the rest of the team, that's, that's important. The same in the Air Force. They're one big team, and they need men who can pull together and play the game. So, oh, you and your teammates should be ascension. This is the biggest all-American team we've ever had. Now, here's a fellow who works in a filling station. I, he looks so he's got something special on his mind. Say, uh, how about it, fellow? You know, I've been interested in the Air Forces for quite a while. But I'm 26 years old and got a wife. And I haven't had a chance for too much education. What about me? Well, from where I'm standing, you look like you're ready to sprout wings any minute. You see, formal education is no longer a basis for determining a man's intelligence in the Air Force. And married or not, you'll receive $75 each month while training, and board and lodging, and all the necessary uniforms and equipment. And you have as much chance as the next fellow of becoming one of those 15,000 captains and 40,000 lieutenants or 35,000 flying sergeants I was telling you about. Yeah? Say, that sounds great. I think I'll go and fool my wife. I'd like to get something straight in my mind. I'm one of those high school students you've been talking about, but I'm not old enough. I wasn't planning on going to college, so... Well, where does that leave me as far as the Air Force is concerned? Well, you sound like the forgotten man. But if you're close to 18, and you're over five feet in altitude, you can be one of us just as quickly as anybody else. Okay. Just make out that application for the Air Force Reserve. Now, your physical examination. Well, that's not going to be so tough. If you're an average guy and normally healthy, you know, you'll make the grade, all right? So one day you say goodbye to mother and dad. I'm pretty proud and happy, too. Especially dad. His suspenders are about to bust. Yeah, you say goodbye to sister Jane and maybe Aunt Minnie. Oh, yeah. 
Uncle Ben, and Brother Joy. Those first few steps down the walk are the beginning of a great adventure. Oh, uh, wait, just wait a minute now. Uh, aren't going to forget that sweet little bit of something next door. And you're on the train with a lot of other fellas. Probably many from your own school or neighborhood. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say, Uncle Sam bought your ticket. And your destination reads any one of a number of reception centers, maybe in California, maybe down in Texas. It's here that lasting friendships are made because you and your teammates are aiming for the same goal, that big, beautiful, wonderful V that spells victory. And now it begins. Now, here's a sort of a composite picture of what happens to you in the first few weeks of your aviation cadet training. Uh, you find your room. Meet your roommate, get a haircut, army style, and try on a new pair of shoes and a new uniform that really fits. Then, time to eat. Those shops are on the fire. Eat with a few hundred other guys just as hungry as you are. In ground school, officers with years of experience patiently explain what makes them fly. And then one day, when class is over, you get all rigged out in what the well-dressed birdman will wear, you feel like quite a guy as you meet your flying instructor. But always in your memory will be the thrill of that first beautiful morning when you took off for the first time. Now, uh, uh, what you're going to see next isn't considered exactly a part of the regular training course. But you're a chump if you don't include it in your curriculum. <laughs> And you find out the effect those shiny little wings have on a gal. And it's phenomenal. And now, mister, take the air. And he did. Well, time has marched on. And here you are, cruising along in a BT. That's basic trainer to you and twisting her tail into a few acrobatics and loops and barrel rolls and snap rolls. That's uh, some fun, huh? And a few more weeks roll by. You find yourself in still another plane. An advanced trainer this time. Yes, indeed, you're really getting up in the world at the rate of nearly 200 miles an hour. But you think this is something. Well, now, just wait. Fellas, shake hands with Mr. B-17 and a few of his big brothers. Now, watch out now. He's tough. Those four motors roaring through the sky like a thunderstorm. They can't fool with them. American workmen, the finest master mechanics in the world, put those motors together. Made them live, made them breathe, made them roar. Yes, sir, a whole army of workmen, designers, engineers, and just plain guys who wanted to do something for their country. They put that B-17 together. A few thousand of these babies will win this war for us. And a few thousand guys like you in there flying and remember, we said something about a team. Well, nine men are inside that plane, each with an important job to do. So let's go and take a look around. Let's meet the team. Yes, sir, nine fellas like yourself working together, as closely coordinated as a precision watch. Now get this straight. The pilot is not the most important fellow inside this plane. All nine members of the crew are equally important. For example, the pilot and the co-pilot can take the plane off the ground and set it back down again, but where would they be without the navigator? Well, meet him. He's the gentleman sitting right there. His pencils, calculators. He's responsible for getting the giant bomber to its destination and back again. Now, you might like his job. Now, this fellow's a second lieutenant, draws $245 each month, and although he was good at mathematics, he didn't graduate from college but he learned that the Air Forces could use his talents. And now he's a necessary part of the team. And now let's go up into the nose of Mr. B-17 and meet somebody who has an important job in that department. This is the bombardier, the boy who doesn't miss. You see, flying the plane is wasted motion unless this lad hits the target on the noggin. 
The finest pilots in the Air Force would be behind the eight ball if the bombardier couldn't hit straight. And he's a full-fledged commission officer, too, wears his wings, draws the same pay as the pilot or the co-pilot. Now, back in the main body of the plane, we've got some more important positions. This fellow is the number one engineer. He keeps the motors turning and the thousands of working parts all through the bomber inspected and in repair. And then comes the radio operator, who keeps the bomber in constant communication with its home base. And the photographer, who keeps a photographic record of what takes place on the Earth below while the bomber's on its mission. He's sort of an official scorekeeper, checking up for future reference. Now, the remaining members of the flight crew are number two engineer and number two radio man. So you see, being in the Air Forces isn't all piloting or all navigating or all bombardering. It's teamwork. And each member of the team is just as important as the next one. Now listen, it takes 38 men on the ground to keep this bomber in the air. So let, let's go downstairs and meet the ground force. Jobs, why there's one to fit every kind of fellow who wants to play on this all-American team. Meet the armament officer. Now, he's in charge of 12 bombers, more or less like the one we just looked over. It's his job to see that the bombs are loaded and the machine guns and a general all-around checkup. See that bar on his shoulders? Uh, he ranks just the same as the pilot or the co-pilot or the navigator or the bombardier. And to get this fellow's commission, a little engineering or physics in college would be a great help. Flight plane will follow after departure. And there's a fellow whose job takes a back seat to nobody, the communications officer. Those bombing and fighting planes up there, they depend on his work. He's part of the team. And how does a fellow get a sign like that on his door? Well, engineering officer Captain C.D. Burns had three years of college. He studied aerodynamics, and those qualifications quickly awarded him his commission. He's in charge of all mechanical details and has a full crew of technically trained enlisted men to supervise. Now, another opportunity for you specially-minded fellows is to be a meteorologist. If you do, you'll be assigned to a post where all military missions will be guided by your reports. Yep, and you'll get those gold bars, all right, after 30 weeks free training in some leading technological institute. Photographers and chemists. Oh, well, there's a spot for you on the team. In charge of one of the hundreds of fixed or mobile photographic laboratories the Air Force must have. Now, this job, too, gets you a commission as an officer. So, whether you're flying a plane as a pilot or a co-pilot, charting its course as a navigator, acting as bombardier, or in any one of the many technical jobs in the air or on the ground, wherever it is in the United States Army Air Forces, you're part of a team. Now, remember that. So, listen to the roar of those motors, young men of America, and heed their call. Soon the skies will be filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own Army Air Forces. The best planes ever built. 65,000 planes this year. 100,000 more next year. That's why we'll lick the Axis. And that's how we'll lick the Axis. Your commission in the Air Forces is waiting. You don't have to have a diploma to become an officer. Join now on the enlistment reserve basis and then finish your present school or college term before you're called upon for actual duty. If you're between the ages of 18 and 26, with a good bill of health, you can make as high as $245 a month, and with a bonus of $500 for each year of service in the Air Forces. Or if you become one of those 15,000 captains we need right away, you'll receive $430 a month while you serve your country. And you'll be well trained for a good job in civilian life when this war is won. Now, here's another thing. Now, it's kind of hard to explain, but believe you me, it's important. You see, while you're getting all this wonderful technical training in the Air Forces, you're learning about other things, too. Things that are going to pay off in big dividends. You're learning to be alert. You're learning how to handle men and how to do that job with a lot of pride. Yeah. You're learning about courage, too. But you'll know what I mean, and I hope soon, because the Air Forces are proud to think that you might be with them. And by the time you finish your training, America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. You see, the way the Air Forces feel about it, 
They're fighting and they're flying for the safety of our people at home, our mothers and fathers and our sisters and brothers. And to keep the terrible war of destruction that swept Poland and Belgium and Holland and blasted homes of good people in London and Coventry and maimed hundreds of innocent women and children in Nanking and Burma and Bataan Peninsula and Pearl Harbor. To keep that war from our own shores, our cities and our homes. The roar of a hundred thousand motors sing their song and theirs is a song of freedom their wings outstretched in the cause of decency. And each spinning prop drones in vengeance against those who would destroy our way of life. But somebody's got to fly. A lot of somebody's have got to fly. Now this is your place. This is where you'll serve America best. Young men of America, your future's in the sky. Your wings are waiting. 